Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my history series, where today I have an incredibly interesting story to share with you of the Navajo Code Talkers. How the Navajo language was used by the USA to help the Allies win World War II. I admit I don't cover many stories relating to the world wars on my channel, mostly because that's all history classes here in England teach you, or at least in my experience anyway, and I actually soured my love of history for quite a few years. But this story is one worth knowing about, and it's one that I'm shocked I didn't know about before you guys recommended it, which is exactly why I love this series. Let's start with the very basics. So a code talker is a person employed by the military during wartime to use a little known language as a means of communication. The most common form of which is the United States using Native American language speakers. Now this video is going to be mostly about the Navajo code talkers in World War II, hence the title, but I don't want to diminish the roles that other Native American languages played also. Cherokee, Choctaw, Lakota, Cree, Mohawk, to name just a few of many. But the term code talker is most strongly associated with bilingual Navajo speakers and their efforts during World War II. Of course, code is really important during wartime. Enemies can pretty easily hack communications, and if you're talking in just plain English or whatever language about your next moves in the war, then the enemies will hear and you're screwed. So things had to be a lot more secret than that when sending messages. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV, who I have a long standing sponsorship with. They're a streaming service dedicated purely to documentaries and you know that each month I like to make a recommendation of a couple of documentaries that I think you should watch and they've got so much fantastic brand new content being released every week I literally still haven't run out of things to watch. This month I have two fantastic documentaries to recommend to you starting with First Footprints a super interesting film length documentary which takes you deep into Australia's past to find the original pioneers of humankind. As a kid I always wanted to be an archaeologist so anything along these lines just really calls to me. You get to see 50,000 years of Australia's history, thousands of years before modern humans ever reached America and Europe. This documentary just really satisfied the hardcore history nerd in me, I loved it. And secondly, we have Intersection, finding a place in a two gender world. As you can probably guess by the title, this documentary explores the lives of intersex people in a world which is so heavily gendered. Girl or boy, your roles and place in society is mapped out for you from the moment you're born. But where do intersex people fit into that? It always amazes me when people are so insistent that there are only two genders because even if you are transphobic, that doesn't change the fact that one in 2,000 babies are born with ambiguous genitalia, not biologically male or female. Intersection explores how intersex people navigate life through society's perceptions of who they should be, discrimination, relationships. It was so eye-opening and again, I highly recommend. Magellan TV have everything from true crime, science, history, nature and everything in between with new programmes added weekly you can be watched anywhere on your TV, laptop and mobile. It is compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play and iOS and loads of the programmes are available in 4K as well. If you enjoy my channel then you very much will enjoy Magellan TV. And I'm happy to announce that my viewers can now take advantage of an exclusive offer, 30% off of an annual membership. That's an entire year of a catalogue of over 3,000 documentaries for less than $3.50 a month. Simply click on the link in the description to claim your discounted annual membership today. And that includes those of you who are already signed up to Magellan TV. Just let your subscription lapse and then you can claim this offer for yourself. The idea of using Native American languages as code came about in the First World War, when the Germans kept breaking the US military codes after tapping their phone lines. 
I don't need to tell you why this is bad. I mean, when you're on the battlefield and the enemy is able to predict every movement you're about to make, that's not good. The US military came across the idea of using the Choctaw language by chance one day, when a conversation between two Choctaw soldiers and the 142nd Infantry Regiment was overheard. A captain asked them what language they were speaking and then asked if anyone else spoke the language that they knew of. They said yes at company headquarters. Quickly, this captain got the men on the field telephone speaking Choctaw and getting the person at the other end to translate it back into English. It was a much quicker process than using coding machines. And so the Choctaw telephone squad was born, consisting of 19 men from the 141st, 142nd and 143rd Infantry Regiments. Of course, the Germans had never heard of this language or even anything like it. There are stories that say the Germans were so baffled by the language they thought the US military had got people speaking underwater. Choctaw, of course, didn't have words for many of the modern military terms, having never had a reason to find words for things like machine gun or battleship, so new words were created. The newly devised code word for machine gun translated to something like little gun shoot fast. Inspired by the use of Choctaw on the field, the military soon started using other Native American languages in a similar way, but all of this sort of started to happen towards the end of the war, and they helped the Allies with the final push towards victory. But then the soldiers returned home back to their reservations, the Choctaws to Oklahoma, and they barely spoke of the vital role they played in the war. It's not an irony lost on me, nor anyone else, that at the time of this war, Native Americans didn't even have nationwide US citizenship. They were fighting for a country that they weren't accepted as a part of, until they were needed for the war efforts, of course and nationwide citizenship wouldn't be granted until 1924, six years after the war ended. And even then, some states refused to let native people vote until as late as the 1950s. 12,000 native people fought on the behalf of the United States of America in World War I. For what? Just a generation or two previously, the 1830 Indian Removal Act had meant that the Choctaw people had been forcibly removed from their ancestral land around Mississippi and forced to Oklahoma, causing mass death from hunger, disease and exhaustion. At the time of the war and many decades before, Native American people all across the USA were being silenced. Each tribe had its own unique language and culture, but American policies, mostly enacted between the 1870s and 1930s, suppressed these. Native people were forced to speak English and English only. The government forced Native children to attend state-run boarding schools where they'd be beaten if they dared speak their native tongue. In their own land, Native people were forced to live on small reservations, forced to become Christian and use English names, essentially forced into the Western way of life. Clearly, I am summarising centuries of oppression here, and perhaps I'll do a full video on this at some point, but the point I'm trying to make is that all across the country for decades, centuries, Native Americans have been suppressed to the point where now, many native languages are extinct or on the verge of extinction. Many native tribes live in virtual poverty. Back then they weren't allowed to vote, barely class citizens, but yet their language was being used for the good of the war. Dr William Meadows of Missouri State University said to Denise Winterman of BBC News, the Choctaw soldiers were incredibly gracious and willing to share their language. They didn't have to, but they did. They had something unique and were incredibly proud of that but the Choctaw people received very little recognition for their contribution to the war effort. The Navajo people had a very similar story to the Choctaws. In the 1860s, the Navajo people were forced out of their homes after a military campaign was created to essentially starve them into submission. Crops and livestock were burned, homes were burned, essentially just because the government wanted their land. Again, there's much more to it, I'm summarising for the sake of this video. It was an ethnic cleansing. 
1864, a huge amount of Navajo people were forced on something called the Long Walk, a 300 mile walk from their original homeland in and around Arizona and western New Mexico to the Bosque Redondo Reservation in Fort Sumner in the east of New Mexico. Many people died on the walk on their way to imprisonment, but the people who did make it were given an inadequate supply of food, water and other provisions. By 1868, a treaty was negotiated which allowed the surviving Navajo people to return to a reservation on a very small portion of their former homeland. And as part of the treaty, they'd be allowed to leave the reservation for trade as long as they had permission from the military. Eventually, the land that they was allowed was increased to 16 million acres, and that land still remains today as Navajo Nation. It occupies portions of Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico, and is the largest land area held by a native tribe in the USA. But just because the Navajo people at this point were now allowed their reservation on their original homeland, didn't mean that they were just left to their own devices. As I mentioned before, the tribe was forced to assimilate with white society. Children sent to boarding school taught only English and punished for speaking Navajo. It was military-like with uniforms, strict haircuts, manual labour, overcrowding and inadequate nutrition. As a result, much of Navajo language was lost to the younger generations. Which brings us up to World War II, when the US military developed a specific policy to recruit and train Native American people to become code talkers. World War II, as we know, began officially in 1939, but the United States didn't enter the war until December 1941, after the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii by the Japanese. But that's not to say that the USA hadn't been preparing for the possibility of joining the war for a couple of years now. It was the US Army who first began recruiting code talkers around the 1940s, but other branches of the military, like the Marines and the Navy, followed later, remembering the success of the Choctaw language being used in the First World War. However, they had a problem. Following this original success of Choctaw being used, Japanese and German scholars had actually started researching native languages. Just speaking straight native language wasn't going to be enough to cut it anymore, and even coded, it might be too easy to break so the military needed to come up with a new idea. Enter a man called Philip Johnson, a white man and World War I veteran who was a son of missionaries who'd moved from Kansas to Navajo land in Arizona. Philip would later say that his father felt compelled to protect the Navajo people, saying, at that time they lived on what was known as public domain. It was a matter of first come, first served. So my father devoted much of his time to securing the rights of the Navajos to the land they had long occupied. As a result, Philip was raised alongside Navajo children and knew the language fluently, so much so that he even served as a translator as a child. He knew firsthand how complicated the Navajo language was, and one day when he was flicking through the newspaper, he read about the military's problems in regards to coding languages. At the time, the enemy was breaking every single military code that was being used in the Pacific, which caused a problem as you can't strategize if the enemy are going to hear. Philip had a suspicion that Navajo was the exact language they were looking for, and met with US Marine officers at Camp Elliott in Southern California to share his idea. These officers passed the proposal to officials in Washington, D.C., and in February 1942, Philip was invited to submit a formal proposal plan. He originally wanted to train 200 Navajo people, but the military opted for a smaller number of just 30. From April 1942, the project was officially initiated, after just a couple of months before, successful tests of the Navajo language had been conducted at Camp Elliott. Four Navajo speakers were able to demonstrate sending and receiving six messages coded in Navajo in incredibly quick time. Navajo men could encode, transmit and decode a three-line English message in just 20 seconds, in a time when coding machines would take half an hour to do the same. But just why was the Navajo language so perfect for this? 
The two biggest reasons are simply that it's not a language spoken by many people. In terms of percentage of American people, there really are not that many Navajo people. And thanks to decades of language suppression, even if you were Navajo, it didn't necessarily mean that you could speak the language to a fluent level. And at the time, Navajo was not a written language, it was spoken only. There was no alphabet, the words were passed down through the generations held onto by memory. So unless scholars from other countries had managed to assimilate Navajo Nation, which let's face it was very unlikely, there's no written record of the language for them to study. And Navajo is a tonal language like Chinese and Thai, meaning that the pitch and inflection of a sound can completely change the meaning of a word. It's generally thought that Navajo has four different tones and there's no words for letters either. There's no A, B or C. I mean, why do you need an alphabet if you're not going to be writing the language down? It was, is an incredibly hard language to learn. Unless you've grown up around it, even the best polyglot in the world would struggle to reach fluency. Hence, it was the perfect language for a code talker. But now the military, the Marine Corps, were up against the hurdle of finding suitable men for their project. These men had to be fully bilingual in both English and Navajo, which was difficult to find in itself as on the Navajo reservation, there was little reason for people to have to speak English. But the men also had to be physically and mentally fit enough to be enlisted. So some were volunteers and some were drafted. In May 1942, the first 29 Navajo recruits attended boot camp where it was said that their physical abilities and understanding of the terrain were far superior to any of the other men at the camp, although cultural differences did cause some difficulty. Following the boot camp, they were then given intense courses in transmitting messages and radio operation by the Marines. Until one day, as Navajo code talker Chester Nez said, this major took us into a great big room and he said, you guys are going to have to make up a code in your own native language. That's all he said. He left, closed the door behind him and locked the door. We didn't know what to think, you know. What does he mean by making a code in our own language? We sat there for about three or four minutes thinking, how are we going to develop this code? But they got to work. Of course, despite Navajo being such a rare language, speaking it plainly was still too much of a risk. Any messages had to be encoded, so anyone listening to messages on the airwaves would not only have to know the Navajo language, but also have access to the code book to be able to understand it. There were two types of code these men created. Type 2 code was the initial code the 29 men created, featuring 211 words, but over the course of the war this became 411. Only those 29 men in that room should have known originally what those words represented. The Navajo language had never had any need for military terminology, so simple words like battleship and hand grenade had to be created. The word battleship became lotso, excuse the pronunciation, I am obviously not Navajo, but that translated directly to big fish. Submarine became Beshlo, Ironfish. There were new words created for military organisations, military ranks, countries, ships, aircrafts, months, as well as hundreds of regular everyday words in English. It was a whole new dictionary. And as there were no words for specific letters in Navajo, the code talkers also had to come up with a phonetic alphabet, words for A, B and C. That was type 1 code. Each letter in English could be represented by three separate Navajo words that could be used interchangeably. The letter A, and please bear in mind that I'm pronouncing these phonetically, would be Wolachi, the Navajo word for ant, or Belasana, apple, or Seinil, which was at. Sometimes the code talkers would spell out entire words with the alphabet they created instead of just saying them, sort of creating a code within a code. Even native Navajo speakers wouldn't be able to decipher what they were saying, let alone the Japanese. 
And that would be a big point of pride for code talkers later on, because the Japanese were incredibly skilled at deciphering codes, but not the one the Navajo code talkers came up with. There is even the incredible story of one man called Army Sergeant Joe Kiyomiya, who was captured by the Japanese after the fall of the Philippines in 1942 and taken as a prisoner of war. He was forced to live on tiny meals of rice laced with weevils and he watched as American soldiers were ordered to dig their own graves and then be shot by Japanese guards. Joe was told that he was going to be the next to die but then he was sent to the Japanese mainland where he was held at a Nagasaki prison. He was initially tortured because the Japanese mistakenly assumed from his surname that he was Japanese American, so he told them that he was actually Navajo. They didn't believe him at first, not really knowing about the existence of Native American people, but eventually they accepted that he was telling the truth, which didn't help his cause at all as it only got worse from there. Two Japanese women visited him, asking him what certain Navajo words meant, obviously having cottoned on to the Navajo code talkers. Soon, the Japanese had him attempting to translate the Navajo codes they heard over the airwaves, but Joe wasn't trained as a code talker and had no knowledge of the code. Even he, a fluent speaker, couldn't understand the messages and any translation he could provide was completely useless. One winter's day, he said, a guard marched him outside naked and he was told he couldn't return inside until he'd revealed the code. If he moved, he'd get shot. Eventually, he was allowed back inside, but his feet had been frozen to the ground and when the guard pushed him forward, the skin on the bottom of his feet tore off. Despite daily beatings and torturing like this, Joe was never able to give the Japanese what they wanted. He actually managed to survive in the end, just, despite the atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki by the Americans at the end of the war. Three days later, he was freed by a Japanese officer and managed to eventually make his way home. He later said to journalist Tim Corti, I salute the code talkers and even if I knew about their code, I wouldn't tell the Japanese. Once a Navajo code talker had completed his training, he would be sent to a marine unit deployed in the Pacific. Their primary job was to talk, transmitting information over the radio about tactics and troop movements, as well as other vital battlefield communications, and they always worked in pairs. During battle, one person would operate the radio, whilst the other would relay and receive messages in Navajo, translating them as they went. In the Pacific, the Japanese were known for targeting officers, medics and radio men, so it was of utmost importance that code talkers remained on the move at all times whilst they did their job. It was really rough physical work, and whilst the code talkers helped in a number of battles, probably the most important one was Iwo Jima. A major with the 5th Marine Division later stated that were it not for the Navajos, the Marines would never have taken Iwo Jima. Six Navajo code talkers successfully transmitted over 800 messages without a single error during the month-long battle. By the end of the war, 13 code talkers had been killed in action, out of the about 420 Navajos who ended up being trained and served and the code remained entirely unbroken. But the Navajo code talkers eventually returned home from war, being told they had to keep their work a secret, unable to tell even their family members what they'd really contributed to the war effort. Because the code had remained unbroken, the military didn't know if the code talkers would be needed again in future wars. There was no celebration, no pat on the back, it was just go back to living on your reservation and don't breathe a word. Decades later, in 1968, the programme was declassified, but still nobody really paid much attention to the work of the code breakers. In 1981, NBC's programme Real People aired a segment about them though, which inspired over 17,000 Americans to write to President Ronald Reagan asking for some form of recognition for their work. Which he did do, issuing a certificate of recognition and proclaiming the 14th of August as Navajo Code Talkers Day.
From there, they've slowly but surely gained more recognition. In September 1992, the Navajo Code Talkers were honoured for their contributions to defence at the Pentagon. 35 Code Talkers, all veterans of the US Marine Corps, attended the dedication of the Code Talker exhibit there, which included a display of photographs, equipment, and the original code. If you go on the Pentagon tour today, you'll still find the exhibit standing, I think. In 2001, Congressional Gold and Silver Medals were given to the surviving original code talkers. Five of them were still alive, but only four were able to attend, and the families of the 24 deceased code talkers were presented with their medals. It took way too long for these men to be honoured for their contributions to the war effort, and the best thing we can do now is ensure their story is not forgotten. More people should know about this. There was a 2002 movie made about their story called Wind Talkers, but from what I can gather the movie is just not worth watching. Maybe one day a legitimate good movie will be made about their story. Maybe. I hope so. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you feel like you've learned something today. I know that I definitely did whilst I was researching for this video, and that is why I love this series so much. I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.